So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off of his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left them. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Thank you so much for standing for the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I am still John Omquist. I have the privilege of being pastor here. Welcome. I really am so grateful to have the joy of getting to spend this time with y'all. I want to start out to like frame our text and where we're going by sharing a story. Now, if you grew up in church or you're even familiar with a little bit of like Christian history over the past century, this might be obvious to you. But I want to ask you, imagine it's the 1940s. It's the 1940s. There is a renowned and famous evangelist going around. He's coming, he's filling tents to stadiums and what are referred to as revivals. These like preaching gatherings where folks are invited to become followers of Jesus and then in their life, hopefully, therefore, following him thereafter. He's going all through the four. He's, it's gaining this divine sense of momentum. Any of you happen to know like who I'm talking about right now? Yeah, Billy Graham, Billy Graham. Now, if it helps you, Billy Graham his growth, yes, it begins in the 40s. It's really more the 50s. There was a different leader in the 40s. Some of you might have heard of this man, but the one I'm actually referring to, though I also would have guessed Billy Graham, his name is Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton was a friend of Billy Graham's. Charles Templeton would travel the country with him, preaching, literally what was marked by him was even before Billy was doing this. There were stadiums full of nightly 30,000 people as Charles Templeton is giving this invitation, this promise, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's my paraphrase. Don't know if he used those words. But something would begin to change in Charles Templeton's life. Even the folks watching said, you know who has that almost like divine anointing, or if you would, momentum? They described it as Charles had more talent than Billy. More people wanted to hear. More people even responded to Charles. So how come we all immediately think Billy Graham, not Charles Templeton? There was a moment that began to grow in Charles's heart. Charles, increasingly into the 50s, would come to feel this sense of, how could all of humanity have so much pain? If God is personal, if God is real, Surely he would not allow such pain to exist. Charles Templeton's faith would begin to decline, so much so in 1959, just a decade after this amazing preaching ministry, he would walk away from the Christian faith entirely. Later on into his life, he would write a book. The title of the book is Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting Christianity. I want to read with you a key quote from it, but it's Templeton sharing how what really broke his heart and therefore his distrust in God, leading to ultimately what we might kindly call deconstruction, which typically ends in destruction of his faith. 
His quote was this, it is simply impossible for me to believe that there is a God who is a personal being, who has a personal interest in each of us, and who answers prayers. Charles Templeton, farewell to God. Now, now you need to hear me say this clearly. I profoundly disagree with Charles Templeton. But I also find that quote hauntingly relatable. Well, let me tell you what I mean. If you grew up in church or you're here and like you consider yourself like, no, man, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm in with this thing. You know that if you're asked like, hey, is God personal? Yes. Does God care about the interests of his people and humanity? Yes. Can God answer prayers? Yes. But have you ever had a moment where you have faced hardship, trial, suffering, where you are crying out to God, knowing you are personal, knowing you care, knowing you answer, but all you seem to experience is silence? And if you're honest, sometimes that silence and prolonged state can become doubt. And doubt can feel crippling. Is it okay to feel that way? Is there something wrong with you? Is there something wrong with me? Well, I, I want to tell you one. That this is the ache of followers of Jesus all throughout time. E even King David, before he fully knew, his language for this was, Where are you, O oh my God? How long will you forget my soul? Have you ever felt in your moment of need abandoned by the God that you love? You ever wanted to cry out, but honestly feared doing so? Because what if he doesn't answer you? Does that mean he doesn't care? Does that mean he's not real? I'm so excited as we're continuing through Acts chapter 12. We are in this section where in this book, as we are looking at the unfolding beautiful and true history of the New Testament church, we're looking in this chapter specifically where here's the massive backdrop. If you're with us last week, you're familiar with this. We are seeing the persecution of the church in Jerusalem. It's, it's particularly, it's led by a man named Herod. Herod, bad guy. We'll recap a little bit more. Herod is persecuting the church. Last week, he killed James. James was Jesus' inner circle. Herod decapitated him publicly after James refused to recant of his faith. Herod would see, ooh, the people liked it when I did that. He's an insecure man. Cruelty is not his problem. Insecurity is his problem. Cruelty is his tool to solve his problem. So driven by insecurity, seeking to bolster a sense of popularity with the Jewish leadership, he says, okay, let's do the same to Peter. Now, Peter, if you're unfamiliar, he's also a big deal in the church. Arguably, he was kind of like the leader of this thing in this moment. And Herod's like, let's go get Peter. They arrest Peter, surrounds him with guards. James is dead. Peter, this text will show us, is expecting and waiting to die. Let me ask you, what was a vision of their prayer life in that moment? Did Peter feel forgotten? Abandoned as he slept in prison to James. And the other character that we'll look at here is the response of the church, the people of God, right? The gathering in Jerusalem. Did they turn from God or did they run to him? I want you to know that there's an ache in your soul if you're a follower of Jesus. And the ache is this. It sits in mine. Does God hear me? Oh, okay, if, if he hears me, does he actually care? And that takes us to the final place. Does he care enough to move? How are you and I meant to steward such a tension? Today, we are going to look in Acts chapter 12, verses 5 through 17. We want to see if there is a path, if there is a way that your faith could sit to we could resolve this, this burden in our hearts of when I hurt, when I get the diagnosis, when the illness comes from me or my family member, when I suffer the betrayal, the abandonment, the abuse, when I am knocked down, does God hear? 
Does he really care? You know you're supposed to say he does. I'm saying, does he really? And do you believe it? Two different questions. And if he cares, does he move? The invitation in this passage is for you and me to come and have the faith of the church, the faith of Peter, the faith that by the power of the Holy Spirit is possible to see my God moves. And I don't always understand him. Is that a church cop-out? Or is that a posture of resolved faith? How do we do it? That's why I'm excited to explore this text. We're gonna see through God's miraculous deliverance of Peter, which is really the focal point of this chapter, by the way. It's like the kingdom of this world wants to enslave the people of God. And God's like, no, watch me spring him free from jail again. We'll see through his miraculous deliverance. We'll see through the church's response initially. And then this text is bookended. They run to prayer and then Peter runs to them while they are in prayer. We'll see the church's prayers and then we'll see Peter's in the midst of it Unwavering faith. We'll explore. Is it realistic to live that way? Or is this something special just for them? Is this realistic for like all those people who take their faith really seriously? Or is this absolutely meant to be something that you have with your God? He wants you to know he hears, he cares, and he moves. How do you trust him in it, though? If you're here and you're follower of Jesus, our goal is to try to discover the answer to that through this text. Now, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, here's why I think that this might be of interest to you personally. Have you guys ever heard the cliche or the saying, um, in a foxhole, there is no such thing as an atheist? Have y'all heard that before, right? If, if not, you should, and you heard it now, because people say it. In a foxhole... There's no such thing as an atheist. Now, what's the premise of that? The premise of that is is, is simply this. In a moment of crisis, even people who do not believe, recognize, or exist, cross-culturally, cross-culturally in time, cry out for a higher power and being to save them. It's like there's this ache evoking a universal yell to God, whoever that God may be, for help. I wonder why. Everyone has that cry. See, many folks in a foxhole can come to believe there must be a higher power. But a lot of folks stop there. What if that higher power not only hears you in the foxhole, but also in the everyday rhythm of your life? What if he hears? What if he cares? And what if he cares enough about you to move? I hope that as you see this text, not only is it true, in the heart of every person is a cry for God to be real, but God has a name. And God wants to come and not just answer the cry and the help of crisis, but to help you become the man or the woman you were always meant to be. All of this is in Acts 12. The Bible's ridiculous. That shared, turn with me to Acts chapter 12. We are going to read verses 5 through 17. Why? Because if we want to answer this, first thing we got to do is we got to understand the passage in the text. If you don't happen to have a Bible, there's always one in front of you. You are welcome to read the screen behind me. That's wonderful. But sometimes when you read it, like a tactile, and you get to track through it, you internalize it differently. It brings in, by the way, another sense. Like, you know, your senses, like sight, touch, see? It evokes more, keeps it a little more. You can keep it. Y'all don't seem to care. Just start reading, John. <laughs> Just start reading. Get him to lunch. So Peter was kept in prison, remember? Sitting in prison, waiting to die. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. (laughs) Hey, Christians, pro tip, pro tip. There's a difference between prayer and earnest prayer. Verse six. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, so Herod and the bad guy bring him out, public spectacle following the festival of Passover, it's gonna kill him. The night before, here's the situation. On that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. It's on lockdown. It's on lockdown. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him in a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. We got to pause right here. We got to pause right here. 
So Peter's passed out. He's asleep. Like, we, if you were with us last week, we talked about Peter right now is in the middle of like deep rim sleep. Like, you ever tracked your sleep score? No? No? Okay. Some of y'all, well, he's getting 100 on his sleep score. All right? Y'all, it's Sunday morning. You're allowed to enjoy this. You're here with me no matter what, unless you want to be rude and stand up. So let's just, let's just get into this thing together, okay? You're okay. But here's the thing. Deep, deep rim sleep. An angel Lord shows up, blinding light. How could an angel of the Lord show up in the middle of a jail cell? Our God does stuff like that. The same angel that will show up, you're going to see is miraculously somehow going to keep the guards asleep, them not noticing the doors open, the chains falling. How is this possible? I have no idea. It's some Christian version of these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> He's going to free him and no one will know. How? We believe in a God, if you're here and you're far Jesus, that when the world stacks the deck against you, if it so be the plan of your father, he'll bring you out no matter what. That shared, continuing in seven, behold, angel of the Lord stood next to him, light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, he's in deep sleep, saying, get up quickly. The chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, dress yourself, put on your sandals. He did so, said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. I love that. When, if you're a Christian, if angels just show up, which by the way, they are ministering spirits sent by God to help, and you go like, Holy Spirit, and you're like, okay, that's an angel. This is like a, it's like a good thing. When they tell you to do something, I just do it. Right? Peter right here, he's not like, could you help me understand? He's like, okay, we're leaving. I'll go. He went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. They went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him, delivered him from prison, takes him a block, likely to where the guards could not visibly see him. And immediately Peter feels the cool night air. The angel's gone. Peter comes to his senses and realizes what's happened. This is no vision. This is no dream. I'm not in a sleep-wake state. God has delivered me. Peter came to himself. He said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. What were they expecting? Him to lose his head the next day. That takes us to where would you run if you just got miraculously delivered from prison? That's where we'll see Peter. Peter's gonna go with what's probably the closest and the safest place there in Jerusalem. It's the dead of night. Peter takes off. Verse 12. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. John Mark, that's an intro to that character. We'll learn more about him in weeks to come. Where many were gathered together and were praying. I love this. He runs to a safe house. That safe house just happens to be a 24-7 prayer meeting for his deliverance. You get that? Like God's merciful and kind. But then the text says, this is a bit of humor. When he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer so she can't see through the gate, but she could hear him. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. Imagine that. You're literally on the run from the authorities. You run to the safe house. You knock on the door. A gal realizes it's you, but she's so excited. She's like, wait, I got to go tell everyone else. And you're like, I'm still outside. If you were going to make this book up, you wouldn't make it this way. <laughs> they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. So then they say, oh, it must be his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened and saw him, they were amazed. But motioning with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. He said, tell these things to James. And to the brothers. Now, some of y'all, you read James, you're like, wait a minute. James was buried last week. This is a different James. This is James. This was Jesus' half brother. He's likely been one of the primary leaders of the church in Jerusalem. We'll learn more about him. The James they buried, Peter could not send them to tell. This James, though, he could send them to tell. Then he departed and went to another place. Scholars have no idea where Peter ran from this moment. 
We'll see him again in Acts chapter 15, but this is really the beginning of a transition and much of the leadership is shown through the book of Acts over the church where Peter takes a step back and will introduce a character by the name of Paul that we'll see more and more throughout the book of Acts. But this is literally a moment in the dead of the night after telling them, you have to go tell the church what Jesus has done. Peter runs for his life. The question we are trying to navigate, trying to understand, is in your moment of trial and hardship, this is a story of deliverance and freedom. It's got a great ending. But what about James's story? Where was his great ending? For you and me, the question is, like in your moment of pain, does your God really care? You know you're supposed to say yes, but foolish, childish Sunday school answers will not suffice for the darkness. How do we find the light? Is it possible? In order to grasp that, we really do have to understand this. So let me just kind of briefly walk back through this. We set the stage at the beginning where Peter has been arrested. Herod, who is he? We talked about him. He is a man of violence, from violence, in a time of violence. He does not care about being cruel. He just wants to be in control. He killed James, so now he's going to kill Peter. Now, here's why this matters. Where is the church? Where is the church in the moment just before Peter's arrested, he's taken off, and they think that he's going to be freed? You remember how they responded? They find out he's arrested, and the first thing the church does is they turn in earnest prayer to God. Prayer to God. Two, two thoughts about that. Two thoughts. Imagine the moment. It's easy to read this and think, you know what? This church in Jerusalem, they must have just came from the best Christian podcast they'd like ever heard in their life. Like they are on a mountaintop spiritual moment. Okay, or, oh, no, 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 they've been doing prayer gatherings before that, and they had this music set, this worship set, where they sang this song, like, it would have been like a Hebrew version, of like, all hail King Jesus, and they're like, oh, this is great, I'm feeling this. They come from that mountain. Was it like, no, 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 they had a conference, like a Christian conference in Jerusalem, and they were all like, you know, we're all going to get together and just leave there, and like, I feel so great, faith, let's run through a wall. Are they coming from a mountaintop moment that leads them into... Peter's likely going to die. We have to pray. No. I imagine for many of them, their cheeks are still stained with tears. You know how after folks cry, the eyes are red? There's like the inflammation that comes. They're like coming from a funeral. They're coming from the moment like, God, where are you? Why would you? Why not just strike down Herod? If you remember the text, that's going to happen next week. God, where are you? Do you care? Won't you move? Are they coming from some mountaintop moment of like this spirit-filled sense of faith where it's like, this is easy. Let's go pray. No. Some of the men uh, perhaps still had dirt under their nails from burying James. And their posture is. Let us pray, which is a fascinating thing. The second thing that that really reveals, if you think about this text for you and me, like, does he really care? In that moment, in that moment, they perhaps had doubt, fear, just like you and me. They are relatable. They are human. Do you think that they perhaps felt in that moment? Why ask God? God won't. God won't answer. The beautiful thing that sits in the heart of this early church is something that's an invitation for you and me. In their moment of trial, they turn to their God in prayer, this posture of dependence. But here's what it shows. In order to do that, they have to believe a few things. It presupposes something in their heart and faith. It presupposes, when I cry out, God hears me. If you don't think he hears you, you don't host a 24-7 prayer meeting. When I cry out, my God cares. When I cry out, my prayers can move almighty God himself. In your moment of pain, suffering, and trial, at the core of you is your first reflex, your first automatic response as it to turn from God 
or to lean into dependence on God. We at least see an invitation of how the church lived it. That's the setup, but that takes us to really the climax of the chapter and then the narrative of what we're looking at today. Herod comes and he stacks the deck against Peter and God himself. If you're with us last week, he put 16 guards around Peter. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Peter's life story, this will be the second time, second time he breaks out of prison, third time he's been in it, in the book of Acts. Surrounds him with guards. God miraculously delivers him. The question is, was this Peter's masterful escape plan? I, I, anyone here ever see the TV show Prison Break? Okay, one person, great. You get it in the title. I tried to watch the pilot for inspiration. I found none, but, but it's about a guy masterminding his escape from prison. Peter was sleeping. This was not his escape plan. This was God's deliverance power. Totally different situation. It sets up in the backdrop, even when the world comes against the people of God, the Father wins. But then it takes us to. Peter comes and he finds this moment where the night air is there and he runs to this prayer meeting. He knocks on the door. He says, hey, will you let me in? You get the humor of the moment. Hey, hey, I'm alive. They can't believe it. They're shocked. They can't imagine and then Peter takes off into the night. We see God's deliverance, and we even see it connected to the earnest prayer. God seems to be showing, yes, God exists in his sovereignty, but our prayer has some type of divine authority. But it doesn't resolve this question for you or for me. Why not James 2? Why not James 2? I think it's really interesting even thinking about that prayer gathering. They'd come, they'd heard about Peter. They likely, it's at least been a few days, 24-7 they're gathered, most likely with fasting. It's through the night. There's people who are awake. They are interceding. In response to the persecution of Herod, the church runs to the only weapon they have. That weapon is intercession. Pleading on behalf of the character, the nature, and the promises of God. God, will you help? God, will you move? To match the violence of Herod, all they have is the presence and the power of God. And they're sitting there, and they are praying, God, free him! Knocks at the door. Do you see the irony in the moment? Do you see the comedic tension? Wait, let me try it this way. Uh, let me speak to some of the single fellas here, Okay? I don't normally say fellas, that felt strange coming out of my mouth. <laughs> Thought it was gonna be cool, it wasn't. Let me speak to some of the single men, right? Regardless of your age, here's something I think you have experienced, and I don't care if culture's changing, all right? Culture can change, but I think it's still true. I think single men have the primary responsibility to go initiate with single females and ask questions like, do you wanna go get coffee? You see that? Men, I hold, bear the primary responsibility doesn't mean you can't go all like Ruth pursuing Boaz. I'm a fan of that. But of initiating and asking. Here's the reason I set that up. I can remember really learning this, and not for like a Christian view of leadership or something like that. I just grew up like the Southern chivalry, like you ask out. I can remember. I can remember. You go to ask a girl out, and here's what every guy does to varying degrees, varying degrees. There's like this internal pep talk. All right, let's do this. I see her. I'm going to ask her. Let's go. I got this, you know? And then here's what happens in life, okay? You ask some of those gals out, and some say yes. It's pretty cool. And some say no, and it hurts. So also respect the men who just refuse to quit, right? The reason I share that, though, is I can remember I would give myself a pep talk. You got this. And then eventually over time, once you feel enough no's, I found myself consciously and unconsciously then giving myself a second pep talk. The first one was, you got this. The second was on my way. And if they say no, you don't really care. <laughs> it don't matter. Her loss. Other oh, fish in the sea. Praise the Lord, I found my wife, right? But I would give two talks. 
The first is, we got this. The second, here's what it was. It was this form of like self-protection. See, you know what it's like to like get your hopes up. And then when your hopes get let down, that fall can be pretty challenging. I say that in a silly environment over asking a girl out. Imagine if you get your hopes up in, Lord, deliver them from the cancer diagnosis. And then what's in the heart of many Christians is immediately almost this reflexive posture of, but I shouldn't expect this. Got to be really careful. You ever felt like you know you're supposed to ask, but you don't think you'll answer? You want, you hope, you pray for a yes, but you expect a no. This takes us back to the text. Do you see the irony? This prayer room had been gathered for the physical deliverance of Peter, and they are surprised. They are shocked. They disbelieve. They have an easier time thinking he's dead and therefore it must be an angel than thinking he's alive and God actually answered their prayers. The only caveat that you could hold to that is maybe they thought God would answer their prayers, just not yet. The only tension there is, well, Herod plans to kill him after Pentecost. That's tomorrow. If he was going to answer, now is the time. Do you see these people who begin in earnest prayer by the end of it, still marked by earnest prayer, but they are earnestly surprised that God answered their prayer? That takes us back to the tension. Does God hear? Does he care? Does he move? He seemed to move, even though they didn't expect him to, for Peter. But why not James? How do we come, if you're here and you're follower Jesus, how do we come to trust him, to answer our prayers, yet ruthlessly accept his will, whether we are delivered in this life like Peter or to the next life like James? You track with me? Here's the answer. How do the people of God, and I'm gonna unpack how it's possible. How do the people of God come to like by faith plead for it, Lord? Break through the prison. And Lord, that man is free no matter what. You can't make a prisoner out of a free man. You can't make a slave out of a son. You captured his life before they could ever take it. How do we live in such a faith? At the core of it, it's simply this. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you and I endeavor by faith, by faith, we trust God's plans. We trust God's plans. Even if he doesn't answer our prayers. The invitation for a mature, loving, deep relationship with God is one where by faith, which is fueled by affection, we trust God's plans even if he doesn't answer our prayers. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that sounds like a cheap Sunday school cop-out Bible answer. Stay with me. Stay with me. Let's look first at the church to see how in the text. They are pleading for, God, make this your plan. Free him. But the beauty of that, they had the faith to ask him for what they wanted. But in their humanity, they also did not demand that he honor their will. That's why, in my opinion, they should not have been surprised that God answered the prayer. Maybe a little bit, but like, oh, we asked for it. He's a good father. He does this. But they're shocked. Disbelieve. They call the righteous messenger crazy. When she insists upon it, they disguise it away within a bad form of theological view of angels. And they all show up to the door to find out what really happens. And they're amazed. Do you see what sat in the tension of their hearts? God, we're asking, would our heart be your plan? Free this man. But even if they were going to trust God, even if he did not answer their prayers. I met a woman at the end of the service just this morning, just diagnosed with cancer. Walked with Jesus for decades. The prayer in her heart comes out of Daniel chapter 3 where saints are thrown into the fire and their faith says, my God can deliver me from the fire. 
But even if he doesn't, he is still my God. The church had this posture of, I'm going to trust him. Even though I don't always understand him. The second place you see this is Peter. How is Peter getting deep rim sleep? It's simple. You could say he starts with an unconditional trust in God. Peter's faith in who God is is not dictated by whether or not he keeps his physical life. We could describe that as he's dependent. The second thing that seems to be true, Peter has literally been in this situation before. Freed from prison once, miraculously, the other time walked out. He knows God can. That means he trusts God is capable. Have you ever had a moment where the best you can do in a trial, a hardship, a fear, the sense of darkness surrounding you is say, I have no idea why God or how God, but you have met me in the darkness before. Therefore, I'm going to find you again. Having met him in the darkness before gives a faith, a credibility, at least God's capacity to meet you in the moment. I also think the other thing's true about Peter. Peter knows what it is like to when God has a plan to try to divert that and take that under his control. And man, there's this thing where Christians, we are responsible and we have meaningful choices. But when Christians flail in seeking control in crisis, Peter has felt the sting of that in his own life. And what is he opting for instead in this moment? It is well with my soul. You ever heard that famous Christian hymn, It Is Well With My Soul? You know who sing, It Is Well With My Soul? People who in that moment, it does not feel well. And they're pleading by faith through the power of the Holy Spirit to make it well. It is a declaration of where they are asking God to take them more than it is a declaration of this is where I am right now in perfect peace. And that's where Peter is. The final thing, and this is total speculation, okay? Total speculation. I wonder if you could ask Peter about all this. Here'd be the one question I would ask him. And you could ask him a bunch, like, how'd you Houdini the locks? Like, did the angel do this type stuff? How'd you do it? You could ask a bunch. The question I would ask is, hey, Peter, Peter, who do you think got the better deal? You or James? Who got the better deal? The, we don't know. The Apostle Paul, he would talk about, it's literally better that I would die to be with Jesus, but if I'm gonna stay here, it's better for your sake so I can minister. But here's the truth about Peter. Peter is not going to avoid the execution. Jesus even promised Peter before he died, hey, Peter, you're gonna die a rough death, hands outstretched. Peter will face the martyrdom. His will come two decades later, approximately two decades later. The question is, hey, Peter, who got the better deal? The one who was delivered immediately to Christ or the one who would wait by faith to be delivered to Christ? It'd be an interesting question to ask. But what does it show you in the heart of the church and Peter, that is the invitation for you and me to have mature, deep, resounding faith. The church, the people of God, those who know his love, the church prays for what they want, prays for what they want, and they trust their God no matter what. Trust their God no matter what. Again, you might be saying, well, that's talking out of both sides of your mouth. You're getting it. There's a beautiful story, because some of you might think, well, that was just first century. This is Peter, James, the church. It's not the same. Famous story. You guys ever heard of um, Corey Tin Boom? Wonderful. Part of a Christian family. Her father's name was Casper, sister Betsy. V very familiar. This story's probably perhaps familiar to many of you. It wasn't to me. I learned this this week. Corey Tin Boom, Christian gal, helping deliver Jews under Nazi Holocaust Germany, keeping them safe. Eventually, her family would be found out. Her father and her sister and her would be thrown in concentration camps. The one she would come to spend the most time in is Ravensbrück. Let me ask you, this Christian family doing the absolute righteous work of the kingdom of God in protecting these, these Jewish people, do you think they prayed before the Nazis, likely the SS leadership of that region, came and knocked on their door? Do you think they'd prayed before that moment, Lord, keep us safe. We want to do your work. Don't let them find us. 
You think they'd ask God for that freedom? The SS Knox. They're taking the concentration camps. Ten days in, her father, Casper, will die. You know who trained Corey to protect people made in the image of God when other folks want genocide against them? She learned that from her dad. This man of faith, gone in 10 days. 10 days. She and her sister, Betsy, would smuggle a Bible into the concentration camp. They would come to lead music and worship services and teachings in the evenings. There's like this mini revival that's breaking out in Ravensbrook. His folks are becoming Christians. These folks, either predominantly Jewish or marginalized, outcast, diminished, sent there, and they are coming to see you are known by God in love in the midst of the greatest darkness, greatest darkness arguably the world has ever known, if not perhaps at least the past century. And they are leading the studies. Eventually, Corey Tin Boom would be set free. Why? A clerical error. Clerical error. Right around that time, though, her sister Betsy would die. Ten days, ten days after Corey Tim Boom was released, every female at Ravensbrook was gassed. You want to know the last things that Betsy told her sister Corey? Betsy said this There is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. Betsy knew how to combat the darkness with the power and the presence of God. You think Betsy prayed to become a Christian example of faithful suffering and endurance and fighting the Third Reich in righteousness the way Jesus would have intended? You think she wanted to become a traveling speaker and missionary just like Corey? I imagine so. But all three of them prayed for deliverance. And I would tell you all three of them found it. Casper found it first. Betsy found it next. And then Corey would wait 39 years after that moment to find it. Now, did God answer Corey's prayers of deliverance? Yes. But Corey, Betsy, and Casper resolved in their heart, I'm going to ask God for what I want. And by faith, I'm going to trust him no matter what. We trust God's plans, even if he does not answer our prayers. But how do we do it? Like at a very visceral, spiritual level, like for you and for me, how can we trust in God's plans? How could trust outweigh fear of perhaps unanswered prayer? Doubt, if you're a follower of Jesus, never fully goes away. If you think being a Christian means there's no doubt, you do not understand the New Testament. Doubting Thomas for Christians is a hero. Not a like, gosh, God should have had it together. No, no, no. We all would have been like, but seriously, can I touch the wound? I need to double check. Trust, but verify, Jesus. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> that would have been you and me. Doubting Thomas is a legend. Everyone else was like, so glad somebody asked. <laughs> wow. Wow. Glad it wasn't me, but yeah, yeah. I, I'll just do it too since we're here. <laughs> you won't remove it. So how does the trust outweigh the fear of answered prayer. At the core, in the New Testament, there's two things. You're going to experience a sense of abandonment at times. Silence. Sometimes Christians refer to this as a wilderness period. You might describe this in church history as the dark night of the soul. David describes it as, where are you, O God? How long, O Lord? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Hope in God. Because he doesn't. Your sense of adoption by God, adoption by God, must be stronger than your feelings of abandonment by God. The gospel, you have to let that actually become enough. Here's what I mean. Corey Tin Boom is alive. Casper, her dad, is alive. There is a hope. They were reconciled to a God they opposed long before that moment that there is a God who did not have to love you, does not have to call you son, daughter, forgive you, clean you, empower you, bestow upon you dignity, beauty, strength. He doesn't have to do it. 
but he actually looks at you. And, and if you believe in him, he says, you are mine. You are my chosen one, holy and beloved. The apostle Peter, the one who escapes prison later in his life, he'll write like a whole book on suffering, by the way. First Peter. He has a key line in it in chapter four, verse 12, where he says this, speaking to, you must understand your adoption, your love by God, more than your sense of abandonment, your fear of not being near to God. First Peter 4.12 says this, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that has come upon you, as though something strange were happening to you. Like the apostle Peter is like, life is hard. Don't be surprised when you meet the hardness of life. You know, biblically, what's most surprising about this text? It's not that trials come. It's how we are identified before God. You wanna know how you can endure the fiery trials? If you really come to know what it means to be the beloved. Beloved. Your sense of affection, love, redemption, hope, intimacy must outweigh your experience of what will be real pain, hardship, cruelty, suffering, illness, loss. But how do we bolster that type of faith? Well, here's a setup, because I think Christians, in my opinion, we can really miss this in, in two primary ways. You, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are meant for great faith. You are meant for great, New Braunfels changing, hill country shaking, America deviating, global impacting faith. You're made for this. This is not something for like special Christians or something like that. No, no, no. This is made for like you, me. The invitation of Peter, James, and of the church in the first century is the invitation of you and me. But there's some pitfalls than when it comes to having a life where we say, I trust your plans, even if you don't answer my prayers, that Christians can at times err in. I want to share with you just two of those in their extremes. They both come with some strengths, and they both come with weaknesses. The first posture that I'll say is trust God no matter what. Trust God no matter what. This typically comes with, man, God's sovereign, so he knows what's going to happen why pray? He's determined. He's decreed. He is willed. Why pray? Here's the pros of this. I love the posture of surrender and dependence. I really do. God is absolutely sovereign. But here's the shadow side or the con to it. God is also Father. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask you will receive, your joy will be complete. In his sovereignty, in my name, prayer has divine authority. We tend to lack a vision of God as Father who wants to help. The second, the second place we can get tripped up is maybe we go from like, okay, trust him no matter what, God's sovereign, this hyper view of this. So then we come and then the posture instead is, well, we ask expectantly, but really we're basically demanding that God answer us. This is typically cloaked, and if this is perhaps your, your faith background or tradition or heritage, where it's like, well, if you have enough faith, God will. If you have enough faith in those around you in those prayers, then God could, God will move, God will deliver. God wants your blessing and your goodness. That's a lie from the pit of hell. If you don't believe me, you could ask James. What's the, the positive side, though? They think God cares enough to hear and to move. I love that. What's the dark side? God becomes like a genie in a bottle. We almost like with our prayers hold him emotional hostage to like, you're supposed to do this, so do it. It's foolish. It's foolish. For you and me to live a life in a posture to trust God's plans, even if he doesn't answer our prayers, we must stop refusing to live in these extremes. So what does that mean? There is a righteous vision, a path of walking with Jesus that holds two things in divine tension. Believe God for an answer. And you trust him in the silence. 
believe God for an answer and you trust him in the silence. In order to do this, you must have two things, two things. One, you must have an actual visceral, emotional, experiential, Holy Spirit indwelling you type, profound sense of God's love for you. Like, you know what the early church did, pro tip? They just believed Jesus meant what he said. I'm going to give you two examples. Jesus publicly said, Father, the way you love me, that's how we love them. The next time you wonder, how does God feel love emote towards you? Think about how does he feel love or emote towards Jesus? You take that and you say, huh, Jesus died and purchased this privilege for me. He's crazy about me. God thinks I am awesome. You are invited to the same thing. They believe that Jesus meant what he said. So you must have a profound grasp of his love for you. And so many Christians settle with like a superficial love. You are meant to journey deeper. The second, the second thing, you must have a ruthless theology of suffering ruthless. Peter's will be freed and James will need funerals. Remember the early church? They just believed Jesus meant what he said. Jesus would say to them, in this world, you will have trouble. Take heart. I've overcome the world. Don't be shocked at the hardship, the betrayal, the abandonment, the job loss, the recession, the, the pending uh, political doom. You find him in the darkness. He's there. He'll meet you. Wait a minute, John. You're saying I believe in faith for an answer and I trust him if I hear silence? Absolutely. And you're not meant to do it alone. Church, you have his permission to ask him for what you want. Ask him. But you must trust him no matter what. How can you do that? Because no one has called you beloved the way he calls you beloved. That one word changes everything about you. Discover the beauty of it in his intimacy. Amen. I'm not telling you it'll take away the pain or the cruelty or the suffering of this life. But there's hope in the darkness. So what do we do from here? Real practically. Two ways. Two ways. If you're here and you do not know this Jesus, I'm telling you, you first got to feel the beloved if you want to find him in the darkness. Part of the reason he sent you here is for you to know, hear, and believe he really does care. This is not some Christian fable thing for those who just grew up in church. Jesus is real. He has transformed the world, and he wants you. He has nothing from you besides faith. If you think that sounds too good to be true, you're starting to get it. Now here, this is the practice if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus. Here's what I want to ask you to do this week. If you're a follower of Jesus, ask God for what you want. Ask him for what you want. Find one thing, reflect on it, pray it multiple times. But it has to be something not small. It's got to be big enough to where you're like, oh, I'm getting my hopes up and they could be let down. That's what I'm after. Ask him for what you want repeatedly and then by faith ask him I really want to trust you no matter what I want to hold in my intercession which is asking I want to feel affection go ask him let me pray as we close in communion Father I thank you for your word I thank you for its power its truth its ability to divide soul and spirit. You are the one that we love. Holy Spirit, would you change eternities? Call us into deeper relationship with you. For the person here who is like scared to ask you for what they want, God, may they feel your invitation and love. For the person here who has been asking and feels like they are in the silence, May they feel your invitation to trust. Make us your people. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen.